and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome to the June 10th meeting of the County Commission. I remind you to silence your cell phones. Um, the meeting documents are on the end of the counter in the black folder. If you need a listening device, um, Robert is in the front row and he can help you with a listening device. Okay. Routine business. I have one. Consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item two is to approve the June 3rd, 2014 County Commission minutes and June 6, 2014 Canvas Board minutes. Do we have a motion to approve both sets of minutes? So move. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve both sets. Any other additional comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Post just passes unanimously. Item three, your bills to be paid in the amount of $533,693.33. Pay the bills. The motion to pay second. the bills. Motion and a second. Are there any comments on the bills? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item four, reports. The Juvenile Detention Center statistics for May 2014 has been received, and that is placed on file in the auditor's office. Item five is personnel actions. A, consider a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. Motion for routine action. Move for approval. Second. A motion and a second to approve routine action. Any comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, item six, there are no application for abatements today. Item seven, notices and requests. A, notice from the South Dakota Board on geographic names of public comment period on proposed name for an unnamed creek in Minnehaha County near Valley Springs. Two names proposed, Annie Anderson Creek and Manning Creek. The board seeks comments in support of either proposed name or any additional proposed names. And item B, Notice from the South Dakota Board on geographic names of public comment period on proposed name for an unnamed island in the Big Sioux River in Minnehaha County near Del Rapids. One name is proposed is Quarry Island. The board seeks comments in support of the proposed name or any additional proposed names. I, I just want to make a comment that um, we the, co the commission did comment um, several months back on um, and send a letter in support of one of the names. So. We've already addressed that, but that is now open to the public. Eight planning and zoning notices. There are none today. Number nine is a petition for a compromise of lien. And Ken, are you doing I think the briefing? Or? Ken. Okay. Mr. Wilka, can you just identify yourself? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm Andrew Wilka, an associate with Wilka and Welter. Um, I'm here on behalf of a client, Brian Barnes, um, in hopes to request a compromise for a uh, county aid lien. Right now, he has a total, I think, uh, I've noticed from the uh, minutes of 6700 some odd dollars of lien. He has a $10,000 personal injury settlement that's on the table right now, and which would currently put him at negative $4,000 still owing. Um, we're asking that you would uh, accept a $1,000 payment in exchange and compromise for a full uh, release of the remaining amount of the lien. And if that's not acceptable, um, in the alternative to uh, accept a $1,000 payment and release the lien as just in regards to the settlement. Are there any questions for Mr. Wilka? Um, Commissioner Kelly? What are the ages of the two girls that they're sporting? Uh, one is, I believe, 16 and the other 14. Now, Mr. Borns, I met with him last night, and he mentioned a third dependent, but I don't see that listed on his tax return, um, and he didn't give me a name or age because I was in passing as he was f signing the documents that he needed to sign. Madam Chair, Commissioner, just point of information that uh, you don't need to use the applicant's name on this. So okay, um, but I uh, have a question for Robert Wilson when he's done. Yep, Robert.
Commissioner. Robert, I noticed that uh, the income tax uh, that we uh, form that we got did not have the uh, earned income uh, amount or the refund amount on it, um, which sometimes can be a significant amount. And uh, I guess that would be important to me to see that. Um, that said, I think that uh, uh, it is very uh, kind of the law firm to bring this forward to us at this, at this time because I'm not sure every law firm uh, goes out of their way to help uh, help us collect some of the money owed us. And so uh, I'll make a motion to uh, accept the $1,000 just in regards to this settlement. I have a motion to accept the $1,000 in regards to the settlement. That would leave the remainder of the lien in place, yes, but release it in um, respects to this settlement. Do I have a second? I'll second for okay. conversation. I have a motion and a second. Commissioner Benega? I'm still questioning the tax return. Um, and I did notice, too, that the two dependents um, doesn't show any of the other schedules. It just shows the... Uh, the cover sheet, so to speak. Yes. Do you have any of that information with you? I do not. I have his Social Security benefit statement, if Board would like it. Just speak into the microphone, please. I have his uh, Social Security benefit statement, and that's his only form of income. If the board would like, would like that document. <clears throat> no, I don't need it. So. No. Thank you. Commissioner was, Kelly. Was there any earned income credit? No, you're not. There, no, no commissioner. <laughs> Abbott, I apologize. He probably liked that. <laughs> I, I guess I don't understand why we didn't get the full income tax return. Any other questions, Robert? Do you have any comments on that? Commissioners, I would just note that I uh, I had the same question uh, that I, I noticed we, when we received the packet of information. It had the single um, tax return on there, and, and I, uh, as you mentioned, that it uh, was uh, uh, I was interested in that because there, oftentimes there may be um, a uh, um, earned income credit or something else on that. But I, uh, but I was providing the information that was provided in totality to, to our office with the application. Any other questions or comments? Is the applicant pre present? He is not today. Okay. He was planning on it. He called my office yesterday and said he was going to be unavailable. So he okay. came down and signed papers because I believe the board requested okay. uh, a petition with his signature instead of just mine signing on his behalf. And they don't have to appear. We just usually ask if they are here. Commissioner Benega? I think I'd like to make a motion to defer this for a week until we get the total application completed. I would second that. I have a motion and a second to defer for one week for completion of the application. And I, specifically, Mr. Wilk, if we could, if we could just get the uh, the schedules that would attach to the uh, tax return, that would be extremely important. Okay. Madam Chair, I think that would be a substitute motion, but I'll yeah. withdraw yes. my motion. Sorry. Okay. So we withdrew the first motion, and the new motion on the table is to defer for one week to um, get additional information. Everyone understand? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is an opportunity for public comment. This is a time when you may speak on anything that is not on the agenda and ask you to please try to limit your time to five minutes. I'm not going to hold you to that. It is not. The commission does not have to comment since this is public comment, but if they would like to respond to you, they can. So is there anyone that would like to speak at public comment? Good morning, and if you'd identify yourself and your address. My name is Lois Boyce. I live with my husband, Dwayne, at 26575 East Shore Place, Hartford, South Dakota. That's out at Wall Lake. And we've owned that property for 20 years. I've made a script of my comments to keep them short and precise. In April, we received notice of a public hearing from the Minnehaha County of Planning and Zoning regarding a conditional use permit that would allow an accessory building to be built at 26269 Park Place that was larger than zoning allowed. 
We did not have an issue with that. What we did have a problem with was that the map that was enclosed with the notice showed East Shore Place and Park Place terminating at the boundary of that property. And I I also have a copy of my comments here for you if you want, because there's quite a bit of detail involved. Okay. Would you like that? Yeah, Robert can give them to her. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. The two access roads to that side of Wall Lake are Park Place, that's the one on the south, which is used by four property owners and Wall Lake Place feeding into East Shore Place, which is used by five times as many or 20 plus property owners. We attended the meeting on April 28th and spoke with the petitioner about the fact that the road was not evident on the map that was provided. His response to us was that he liked his privacy. And when the time came for comments, we mentioned the fact that the road was not shown on the map and were told that the Office and Planning and Zoning would look into it. Later that, that week, I went to Minnehaha County Register of Deeds Office and with the help of an employee there, research was done on the Park Place address. Using the card catalog, the large record books, and the computer, we were able to find the 1954 survey map of tracks 14 to 27 of Bowman subdivision of part of lot 7. I have a copy of that. And that's also in your packet. I know those numbers are hard to see from where I'm standing. The property in question is tract 22 Robert, and the north half can you maybe point where she's doing what she's talking about? Track 22 is right here. <coughs> yes. And tra track and the north half of track 23. Right there. Our property are tracks um, 14 and 15, which are the first two. The survey shows a 20-foot wide private access road extending from lots 13 to lot 25 that was to be maintained by the owners. This road was maintained, as you see, for some time, as I've been told that a school bus used to travel through there to pick up children. However, at some point in time, the previous owners of 26269 Park Place put up a temporary barricade consisting of two steel fence posts with a chain or rope between them that blocked access, though I assume it could have been taken down in an emergency. Because the road was no longer used, vegetation began to take over, and now there is a section of fence there that completely blocks access. This has created a serious situation. Several times a week, large garbage trucks have to either back in or out of the area. A truck delivering a load of gravel recently did damage to property because they were backing down the road. And last week, we watched a pickup with a 24-foot trailer attached attempting to deliver a dock on East Shore Place. And emergency vehicles would have difficulty gaining access, and the list of safety issues is endless. I took a copy of the survey to the Office of Planning and Zoning and they put a note on it to call the owner. Last Friday we were at the Office of Planning and Zoning to pursue another matter and asked about the outcome of the phone call that had been made. We were told that the owner had said that he was not interested in having the road there and the zoning employee seemed to believe that it was his prerogative since he owns the property on both sides of the road. I responded that there were four other property owners along that road who had property on both sides and using that theory 
Any of them could reasonably close the road if they liked their privacy and were not interested in having traffic go past. I am also aware that those property owners would tell you they have no intention of blocking access, but on the other hand, some of them strongly support the right of the current property owner to do that very thing. We asked what recourse was available to, to us and we were told to come here today. A few hours later, after returning home, we were confronted by several of our neighbors, one a county employee and the other who is married to a county employee. They said they had received emails and phone calls from county officials and or employees letting them know we were attempting to have the access restored. It became very apparent then that someone with a lot of power and authority wanted access limited and we realized that some of our neighbors and even some county employees could be intimidated to the point that they would not care to be involved in this discussion. We understand the fear of consequences may limit the possibility of a positive outcome for us. It's very disturbing to us that the accessibility and safety of a neighborhood can be marginalized by someone in a position of power but we have witnessed others accepting the fact that laws can be ignored because of possible retribution from persons of influence who have something to gain. Do you have any questions? I think this is a time for public comment and it's not an agenda item, so if anyone wants to comment or does anyone have any comments? I think... Is, is is this a private matter or is this a, I mean, is this like a covenant? Is it, is it not the purview of us or is it in fact something we have to deal with? Kirsten. Is, is the with, road is a, what, an easement? Yeah. Without knowing no, more about this, is, is it your understanding, ma'am, that this road is, is allowed access by easement or is it by uh, a prior conveyance? Pardon? When the original plot was drawn and filed with the county, there was a road. I, I understand that, but is your right to use it by easement or what other right? Right, by easement. I can we not respond. have someone yep. make comment. The gentleman is nodding his head. And, and I guess generally, before we get the answer, I would say what it sounds like to me is one private landowner is having a dispute with another private landowner over private rights that have been arranged by contract here. And I'm not sure the Planning and Zoning Department or the county, for that matter, has a role in 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 defining what those rights are as to a private road. I mean, this is not a public road. I think that's a clear distinction. Whenever here. we whenever we try to get a building or um, some type of structure, we follow the setback rules that the county provides along that road. Even though it's a private road, we have to follow all of the rules and regulations of the county regarding setbacks and all of those details. I think that maybe we can talk to planning and see, you know, what. Um, kind of clarification we can get from them. But since this isn't an agenda item, I think we're just has to leave it at that. Kirsten, you got any you, other comments? You can ask any questions you'd like on a public comment, you know, period, but that's up to you guys as the commission. If you Anybody want to take other public any? comments, that's fine too. Well, if could we then keep her informed of, of what, and what we find know, out. in fact, if it is a private matter, it's just not, it's, it's not a, uh, our issue. It, but to, to measure you among parties, if if it's a road of some sort, then then we do have there. But I think we need to keep her informed of, okay. of uh, what. And we have, have, a, have to make sure you get her name and address. Yeah, through. it does. Cindy's got a name and address for the record. Did you want to say something? You have to identify yourself. Sorry. My name is Dwayne Boyce. I'm Lois's husband. Uh, to me, the issue isn't anything to do with anything other than safety. If a fire truck answers a call and manages to get in there, no ambulance, no 
personnel, uh, emergency personnel will be able to access that area because it'll be blocked. Furthermore, we have had cases where there's been five deputies pull up to a house, the road is totally blocked, we had to walk around because there was no way to get to our place. That's happened in the recent past. And I am concerned for public safety. There's people that say, well, our grandchildren play in that area. We don't want people coming through. Their grandchildren get five and six of them piled on a golf cart and drive up and down the road carelessly. That's their idea of a private road. And it's not for play. It's not for personal. It's for safety. And if, if 911 and emergency personnel have no interest in this, I would be very, very surprised. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, this is public comment, so if you'd like to make a comment, you um, identify yourself and... Uh, my name is Art Umlin. I live at 46274 Park Place. And uh, my home was completed in uh, 1977, so I've lived there ever since. I've known the people, I was, uh, there's the easement that covers our uh, access to the four houses that are up there. Uh, I was uh, one of the signers on that and stuff. There was no written documentation prior to that time. And so to make things uh, <clears throat> as they should be as time went along, the four landowners that were involved, we. Uh, signed an easement, you know, had an established legally, and uh, it specifies then that that particular wall lake uh, uh, that our access in there uh, is uh, shared by the four people. We take care of all the maintenance, and then from a historical perspective too, the uh, lot that's most in question as far as actually being crossed, where it's going to be crossed now. Uh, over to uh, Barney Benson owned when I first arrived there. He sold the piece of property where I uh, built my house and stuff. And knowing Barney Benson and then the other people that were there at the time, such as Elmer Gasky, who had been there a long time also, there was no established road through there. And, uh, and had there been, then it would have had to get treated in the same fashion, I would think, our access. There'd be no reason for us to have a separate as access uh, designated for us to get up and down there, you know, an easement, I should say. Uh, as far as I know, there is and has not been any tra uh, traffic on a regular basis up and down that road. And, uh, and this is just personal comment from myself. Um, uh, less than uh, uh, Connie Fiat, the current owners that have taken over Barney Benson's spot there. Running that on through there would make a considerable difference in that property uh, and its value to them and stuff. And it would cut in half that property that they paid a reasonable sum for to get on the lakefront and stuff would be greatly changed by doing this. And I think that should be taken into consideration. But as far as there being any regular road up there, any maintenance for it by anybody else, it didn't happen. Thank you. Did you want to comment, sir? Um, I'm Wayne Schnabel. I live at 26583 East Shore Place. Um, I am right at the end of the road. And um, basically, they talked about 20 homes out there. Well. Ten of them, the road curves to the south, and the other ten, the road curves up to the north. So there's really only ten homes down in that area. Um, when it comes to safety, I have three grandchildren that are seven and under. We don't have golf carts. We don't have whatever running around. But I'm concerned about that being open and the amount of traffic coming through for the safety of my grandkids. I can't replace them. If my house burns down, I can replace that. Um, so I don't understand. I've seen the garbage cups, trucks come down. They pull in 
back up and go into my driveway and drive out. Um, so I'd like to see it stay the way it is. Okay, thank you. My name is Rhonda Milstead and I live on Park Place. And I actually brought that agreement for you to keep as long as you have some other papers. Okay. Um, but this is, it isn't a road. We keep calling it a road and it's not a road. It's a mutual driveway easement um, that those four homeowners agreed to, to give them access to the property. That's all it is. Um, so I would like to leave this with you as well and yep. hope that this, I mean, it is private. It's private land that these homeowners turned into an easement. That's all it is. It's never been defined as a road. So okay. I'll give that to you. Thank you. Give it to Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on that issue? Yep. My name is Les Fayok. Along with my wife Connie and I, we own the property that's in question here. I would like to uh, correct the address is 46269 Park Place. I've had a private discussion with Mr. Boyce. I told him in the case of emergency, I have no problem with a fire truck or ambulance going through that property. It is not a roadway. However, my feeling is it's a convenience factor for Mr. and Mrs. Boyce, and we're not turning that into a public thoroughfare. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other comments on that issue? Any questions or comments from the commission? I just say maybe we could have our planning and um, look at this, and uh, maybe our um, attorney can look at it to see what our um, response would be to that. If there's anything, we can get back to you. Okay. Thank you for your public comment. Is there any other public comments on another subject? Good morning, Robert. Yeah. Uh, my name is Teresa Staley. I'm at 1621 South Van Epps Avenue here in Sioux Falls. And I'm here today to talk to you about our election last week. Uh, I was a superintendent at St. Mark's Lutheran. And first of all, I want to say that Bob Litz has been very helpful and easy to work with and affirming. So this is n I'm not here today to, to bash Bob. Okay, Bob? <laughs> uh, but but we have some problems happening, and these things have been happening in Sioux Falls for several years now. Um, and there was great voter confusion at St. Mark's Lutheran last Tuesday, and I believe uh, there was confusion throughout our city of Sioux Falls. Uh, we had a constant stream of residents who had been longtime users of St. Mark's Lutheran who came in and did not have their names in our book. And so I would call down to the auditor's office and they would look in the book and I, was, I would have to tell these people, your voting place has been changed. And it was anywhere from Trinity Baptist to O'Gorman to Asbury Methodist to the Center for Active Generation. And these people were never notified that they don't come to St. Mark's Lutheran. And these are our mature adults, so they've been voting for a long time. One couple came in, an, elder, uh, an older couple who I know well, he's a retired pastor, and um, she came in and their names weren't on the books and I called down and was told that my friend Darlene was not registered to vote in Minnehaha County. Um, she got on the phone and let that lady know that she had been voting there for 40 years. Then they, I was told to just write her name in the book. So I think part of the problem in that instance is that we shifted books and I don't know if the sec Secretary of State got things mixed up or however that, that mess up happened, but I have been, Bob told me that he's, they're gonna be going through every name to make sure that that part gets cleared up. Um, other people came in and we had just had a city election on April 8th, uh, a little more than a month earlier, and people thought it was voting center again. So they're heading wherever they voted before and thinking they can do that. And so at the end of the day, what we have is great confusion with our voters. 
and we they deserve better than this and, and I'm talking about school district city or state or county it's it's across the board we're all guilty there are all of the, the election people uh, we need to have better communication taking the guesswork out of where we're going to be voting and uh, as I've been talking with these different entities I, I can say and Jeff and I had a wonderful conversation last week but here's the truth we are never going to have consistency in voting I would love to have a precinct that stays a precinct no matter what election it is. That is never going to happen. The county cannot afford to do that. The school district's doing their own thing. The city's doing their own thing. It's not going to come together. So the solution to me and to people I visit with would be that at every election, and I'm going to talk to the, the city council about this as well, at every election you mail us a card that tells us where we will vote. That way, if it's voting centers, we have those options. If it's your normal precinct, you say you will be voting at Hope Lutheran or whatever. I know it's going to take a little extra work. It's going to cost some more money to mail a little bulk mailing postcard. But then people will have that in their hand. They'll know that. And in Sioux Falls, I believe it's around 88,000 registered voters, 88,000, 90,000. That maybe you'll get more people to turn out too. You hit those people, you say, here's the election coming up, here's where, this is the issue, here's where you vote. Then you, you've at least given them the right information because I think they really deserve that. So the, my thing is going to be mailing. Let's do that. And that way you can do, have the elections wherever you want to. Uh, the second thing I want to talk to you about is these people who work at our voting sites. God bless them. For years I voted at Horace Mann. I come in, I see my neighbors sitting there and I think, oh yeah, that's nice. They're having a little coffee. They come in and out and they're helping us out. Well, then Bob asked me to be a, a superintendent at the last presidential election. And oh my gosh, I did not realize what a commitment these people are making. And you go in the night before and set up and um, that takes about an hour. But the day of the election, I have it down here. I mean, you're, these people are coming in approximately 6 a.m. in the morning, and they're working, sitting there till 7 p.m. That's 13 hours. And a lot of times, there's not time, time for a break. 13-hour uh, day. And then, at the end of that day, you do manual labor. Where I was at, we had to put tables back, chairs, moving them around. I mean, you're brain dead by the end of 13 hours. And we had to take the auto mark thing down, that's heavy. I had people there who had bad backs. Um, taking the voting booths down, it, to me, it, that, it's overkill. And I know that it was difficult getting people to come in and help with these 60-some precincts. But we've got to find a better way to make this manageable to attract new people to help. Uh, two things I, I s said to consider, a split shift. You know, asking someone to come in and work six hours, that could be doable. Um, or at least breaking it, having a thing where people could take more breaks and have a, you, because you, once you're there, you can't leave. I mean, you're 13 hours, you don't leave. Uh, the second thing I think would be, needs to be done is you have a team of people, younger people, Boy Scouts, whatever, come in and take, do the manual takedown. Because it, it, that's just, the, our job is to protect the sanctity of, of the ballot. But doing that work at the end, that, that's it's too much. It's, other people could help with that. So those are my suggestions. I do think there is, I think this is an issue. If there was some way to do a petition drive, I, I would be right out there doing it. Because I do believe that the anger, frustration in our community is rising, and whatever the election is. And something is going to have to be done. So that's, that's my two cents worth, and I thank you for listening. You're a great group of people. Thank you, Teresa. It was Hold great on. to have it written, too. Madam Chair, Could, I guess yeah. I'd like to That's ask fine. A I just wanted to comment. And by the way, I think your name is synonymous with petition drives. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, you know, that when you talk about the voters that, in your, that came to you being reassigned to different places, had they moved or? No, they were, nothing had changed through the years. Do you think they went and voted in those Lake Well, I hope that they did. One guy had been told, uh, we were the third place he had been directed to. So I, 
I, and it was, yeah, it was raining that day too, so that was difficult. So did they get a different answer when the other precincts called in and then? I don't know what, where, what had happened with him, but the other people when I called in, and I, you know, Bob's office was very busy. good. Uh, well, I'm sure they were busy, but they were good about saying this is where this person goes now. But there, I mean, these people were like flabbergasted. Why am I going to O'Gorman? I've never been there. What, what, how did this shift happen? No one told me about it. Guessing game. I mean, it's, it's not acceptable. And I think we're still playing by the same rules that we had 20, 30 years ago when we were 50, 60,000 community population. We're growing, and we have not been able to work with that. We've got to change how we're thinking about this and relying on TV, because some people have said, well, we had the TV, we had the Argus Leader, we have Internet. Forget it. Pe a lot of people aren't connected to those things. We, can, we should not be pushing our public service to people on those media entities. We've got it. You have an opportunity with this bulk mailing thing to touch them. Just like you send out the drivers when we have to have, renew our driver's license or property tax. I think, I think in, like I said here, if you ask the public, would you like to spend a little tax dollars to have that in your hand, they would say yes. We would love to have that. Madam Chair. So, Teresa, I know that uh, one of the postcards that got sent out, not by Bob's office, but directed people to vote at First Lutheran on North Minnesota Avenue, which, of course, it was the wrong address. And so even on postcards, oh, okay, uh, I didn't can hear be that moved one. up. But I also talked to someone who worked up on the poll books on the city election, and after a 13-hour day, you mentioned brain dead, they were saying 4,000 voters, 13 hours, mistakes happen. And uh, that is certainly an issue. You mean, so about the people working there? Yeah, I mean, that was the same. Well, and it's group. a huge responsibility. I mean, it's, and then we're counting the ballots. I mean, the, the whole thing, I don't think the public realizes how massive this is. They just assume that you go in and cast your vote. And so uh, hats off to those people who do it. And, and they're, they're, you've got one gal uh, over at, uh, she used to be I, at IPC, Hilda. I talked with her. She's been doing it for like 20 years. I mean, and she's eight in her 80s. Wow. I mean, you've got some fabulously dedicated people. But I think we, we can lighten the load a little bit by being creative. Any other questions or comments for Teresa? Again, Teresa, thank you, and thank you for putting the written suggestions down for us and stuff, and we will see what we can do to have the auditor look into some of these things. Thank you. Are there any other public comments that are not on the agenda? All right, with that, we will move forward with today's agenda. Regular business, item number 10 is a public hearing to consider joint spending plan between the City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County for the 2014 Burn Justice Assistant Grant and authorize the Chairman to sign the interlocal agreement between the City of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County for the grant. Michelle Boyd. Good morning. Michelle Boyd, Chief Deputy with the Sheriff's Office. On May 27th, I was in front of you and presented the spending plan for the Burn JAG grant, which is a disparate allocation between the City and the County. Um, just to, if you recall, that amount that came in um, is $70,599 in which the county will receive 35% of that and the city will receive 65%. I'm here today to ask you to sign the agreement between the city, the mayor has signed the MOU, and we would just request that you do the same so we can begin that process. This is a public hearing, so are there any questions for Michelle? Is there anyone that wants to speak? Uh, as a proponent to this? Is there anyone that wants to speak as an opponent? Seeing none. Madam Chair, I make a motion to authorize you to sign this uh, MOU. I have a motion. Do second. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any additional comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Thank Michelle. You. Item 11 is a public hearing to consider drainage permit application number 13-61 from John Zomer to conduct agricultural drainage on property legally described as the Northwest Quarter, except RY and except Sabres Edition, and except the North 660 feet, West 660 feet, in Section 1, Township 102 North, Range 48 West, Brandon Township. David Heinold. Good morning, Commissioners. David Heinold, Planner 1. 
Minneapolis County Planning Department. The topic of this public hearing, which notice was sent out on May 12th for the public hearing for drainage permit 13-61 and 14-20. Just to give you a brief overview, um, the location map, this location is about two and a half miles southwest of Garrettson. It's at the corner, the southeast corner of Edison Township right here and the northeast corner of Brandon Township. Um, the, the, there's an existing tile project that John Zomer, that's drainage permit 13-61. This is the area outlined in yellow. Um, this project, which I'll get to in, in a second, outlets, outlets into an intermittent stream and is within one mile of Split Rock Creek. And this area outlined in red right here, these two areas right here is a proposed tile project, which is 14-20, which the downstream property owner, Daniel and Elizabeth Irvine, they submitted an appeal of an administrative decision, which is why we're holding this public hearing. Um, on that drainage permit 14-20. And 13-61 was submitted as a complaint, uh, an official complaint regarding the effects that the proposed tile project and the existing tile project would have on um, the downstream property owners well in terms of just contaminants of just chemical, possible chemical pollution from the increased um, drainage. So this just shows the two tile projects, the proposed tile in red and the, the existing tile project as well as the outlet. And I'll go into further um, and explain drainage permit 13-61 that was submitted by John Zomer. And this was back September 13, 2013, we approved the drainage permit because it does outlet into an intermittent stream as you can see right here. Um, and this outlet is within one mile of Split Rock Creek. Hence, there was no downstream notification required. <coughs> This is an existing bore under 256th Street look, looking south. If you move down the line here, this is looking on to John Zomer's property and then continuing to look parallel with the, the stream that heads towards the outlet. Um, these are just some feeder lines that would connect with one of the main outlets. And then this, you can kind of see the outlet in this one. I'll show the a better picture of the outlet where it connects with the stream that would connect with Split Rock Creek. Um, right here, this is the tile outlet that outlets into the stream, which as you can see, it's a um, pretty heavily wet area. Um, this is the intermittent stream looking northwest, and this is on top of the, um, right here. And this is looking southeast onto the downstream property owner, Daniel and Elizabeth Irvine. Um, this is the, the stream that connects back to Split Rock Creek, as you can see back here where um, the trees are. This is the location of the creek. Um, and if you have any questions on drainage permit 13-61, um, I'd feel free to answer any questions that you have right now. Um, if not, then uh, I can proceed with drainage permit 14-20. Are there any <coughs> questions on this first permit? My first, well, go ahead, Commissioner Kelly. We've got... Can we talk about it? Sure. We have a memorandum here from Kristen uh, regarding our ability to even con even consider 1361. So I, I don't know where perhaps we should hear from Kristen on uh, whether we should proceed on this. If uh, you wish. Yeah, Kristen, if you could. Um, I think we're, I think there's a question on the timing of when this was um, petition was filed. So, Kirsten, if you okay. want to address that. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, just to be clear, um, as far as our uh, drainage ordinance goes, this was not an appeal taken within five days. It was not It was not an appeal. It was an official written objection that was filed contemporaneously with, uh, with 1420. For 1420. Okay. So, I guess as far as any, and I know we're, styling it differently but as far as any appeal that you normally have under article one I, I i would i would say that it's not timely and it's not appropriate under under article one uh, under article four um people can bring more generalized uh drainage uh complaints if you will what our Article 4 of our ordinance says, though, is the county commission has to exercise jurisdiction over those type of disputes 
affirmatively. So if this is the type of dispute that you want to exercise jurisdiction over and make decisions about before you in this posture, um, you will have to elect to do that. Um, the effect of doing that is we'll have existing permits already approved and appeal rights have, have passed or an appeal has already been taken and rejected where uh, complainants will be able to come in and uh, address a previously granted permit. And I guess what, what I'll say about that is this. If you allow these type of, of challenges under Article 4 to come over you, and it's up to you to do that, um, that opens you up to arguably under equal protection grounds everybody similarly situated who wants to come in and challenge an existing approved permit before you, you will have to take that up. That, that's my legal opinion. So if you exercise jurisdiction over this today as a generalized drainage complaint about what's in 1361, you're committing yourself to making this a, a, a forum in, in resolving that. Um, if you decline to do that, um, there is a remedy in circuit court. Uh, the statutes are very clear that people can always bring a dispute to circuit court uh, over existing drainage projects. However, if you exercise jurisdiction over that today outside of Article 1 into that Article 4 area, I would say that you'll pretty much have to hear all of these about existing uh, drainage projects. If you want to do that, that's fine, but that is, that is the uh, consequence of doing that today in my opinion. An opinion from our state attorney's office. Any comments or questions for Kirsten? And maybe Scott has something additional or maybe. <laughs> well, based on what I just heard from Kirsten, um, I would like to uh, give you my recommendation. And I didn't introduce myself, sorry. Scott Anderson, County Planning Department. and. As you know, all of these drainage, uh, under Article 4, this would be a drainage complaint. And my recommendation to you as the drainage board would be not to open that can of worms because what we're going to have then is just a, a continuing uh, option or, uh, you know, we're just going to be dealing with these over and over again where, where, where we issue them administratively. They have the right to uh, go into a named stream and, and we went through a process, uh, Commissioner Kelly, Commissioner Barth, and a, and a large drainage task force crafted that ordinance to allow that without having to get downstream property owner signatures because it is an intermittent stream that is within one mile of a named creek. And then, thusly, there should be very adequate drainage to, to handle a, a tiling project. My concern is that if we open this door, and we start administratively, be, administratively reviewing all of these as a drainage complaint, then um, we're just adding a whole nother layer of, of, of review, and I think it's going to just bog down the system. I mean, I, I think there's a potential for that. And, and can I add yeah. something? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I would add to this. I don't see any allegation in this one that it's not functioning as it's supposed to or tile has been laid in a place where the permit didn't allow. I think you can make that, dis you can distinguish those type of cases from this in which I don't, th I don't think there's any allegation that the tiling is in any differently than it was, uh, than it was approved and functioning as it, it was approved. You can make that distinction, I think. But in this case, I think Scott's concerns are valid with that if, if there's not those other functional or compliance allegations. I could see a situation where Article 4 would be appropriate for that. So, <coughs> Madam Chair, yes. I for one don't in, in any way intend to uh, go back and review every single drainage case we have. At the same time, in this particular case, with the continued application of uh, 1420, it's sort of germane to the discussion on, on that. So I'm happy we've had this, uh, this presentation on the, the project from last year. But I think uh, that we should go ahead and move forward and listen to 14-20, which is the, the new application for this year. And uh, we'll just see where that goes. I think we'd have Madam to have Chair. a motion. Yeah, yeah the, the, 
Uh, Kirsten has recommended we pass a motion to decline and to hear the matter due to the untimeliness of the appeal under Article 1 and to de deny, decline to exercise jurisdiction under Article 4. And I would make that motion. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Just a second. Just a second. We have to finish the motion first. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Yeah. And since we have had, if I may, mm -hmm. sorry. Sorry. Uh, since we have declared a public hearing on this, I think as to what you're proposing in your motion or as what we're discussing about the jurisdictional matters, the uh, timeliness, et cetera, I think hearing the proponents and the opponents is appropriate okay. as to that part of it. So We have a motion and a second on the table. Did you want to make a comment, sir? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Irvine, I'm the property owner downstream from there. In order to file a five-day appeal, I would hope that you guys would send out some kind of notification that this is in process then. Otherwise, how is the property owner supposed to know that there's been a permit put out? Uh, how, how can you appeal it? This permit was taken out last year. The digging didn't go on until this spring. How am I supposed to know that that permit is being issued and I have a five-day window from when? Last September, yeah. Right, it's a good but point. I've never been notified. The only, the only th thing that was brought up on this was when I saw him digging, I went and investigated it, and that's how I found out that there have been permits issued, and then I also found out about the other two permits. You were, not, one permit. you were not notified as a downstream owner? Uh, in this type of correct. ordinance, he does not have to be because it is into an intermittent stream. So that is part of the ordinance, which was in our jurisdiction. So Thank you. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. question. And, if, and if I may, if you uh -huh. think that notice isn't, isn't sufficient, that's a matter to amend the ordinance. Okay. So. Any questions or comments from the proponents or opponents? Go ahead. <clears throat> Morning. I'm uh, John Zomer. Uh, I am the one that installed initially uh, applied for a drainage permit last September. Uh, I, I completely understand uh, Mr. Irvine's uh, concern. However, in this particular case, I would uh, like to inform you that after I uh, um, uh, obtained a drainage permit last fall. Um, I had tile, big rolls of tile pipe delivered to my farm that sat there all winter long. That in this particular case would have been for Mr. Irvine a pretty good clue that there's some drainage um, uh, projects in the works. And he did not say anything uh, or file any complaints until after I actually installed the tile this spring. So, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> we have Any a other comments? Commissioner Berth? We have a motion. Yes, we have a motion. Oh, did you have another <coughs> comment? I don't want to go back and forth and rebut yeah. this all the time, but, but uh, the tile was there. He could have been draining the other side yeah. of, of the properties and stuff like that. The three gentlemen um, that are here in question about all the drain tiling going on in this situation came over to my place about two years ago and asked me if I had a problem with it. And I expressed that I did have a problem with it. I have this, our farm is operated solely on a well. We do not have rural water. I was afraid and am afraid that that will contaminate my well. My well is within 300 foot of the outlet of those drain tiles. My drinking water is. So I'm very concerned. Uh, I, I honestly thought that he was going to run the tile <coughs> down the other side. Um, it wouldn't be coming down this direction. I, I didn't have any idea what the plot was or what the, what the uh, diagram was. So um, that's just in response to the drain tiling. The drain tile was setting up there on top of the hill on a vacated road, which is right on the, right on the road way so I didn't know if it was going to the south or I mean to the east or to the west of that road it was just setting up there in a pile so. Madam Thank Chair you. 
I think we should vote on this now because this is just discussion that we can yeah. have on the, on the second next application. One. Um, we have a motion and a second on the ta table to um, decline to hear this matter um, due to untimeliness of the appeal under Article 1 and to decline the exercise of jurisdiction under Article 4. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. That particular one can be taken to circuit court for appeal. That will go on to the next one. Good morning, David Heinold, Planner 1, Planning and Zoning Department. Um, drainage Permit 14-20, which, as I mentioned, is an appeal of an administrative decision which was filed within five working days following approval, which was on May 1st, 2014. This was submitted by Stanley Hansen and Pete Johnson. Um, as you can see, the two properties, um, Pete Johnson's property is right here, is the two tile lines, um, and then Stanley Hansen. Actually, I got that backwards. Um, Stanley Hansen's property is this long rectangular piece right here, and Pete Johnson's is right here. Um, this, is an this is a proposed tile project that would connect into an existing tile project, drainage permit 13-61, which the outlet is into the intermittent stream, which is within one mile of Split Rock Creek, just for your reference. This is an this is the proposed area where the tile would go. Um, this is looking south towards 256th Street. Um, this is continuation. This is on Pete Johnson's property, looking southeast towards, back towards that connection. Um, this is looking parallel with 256th Street. As you can see there, the outlet would be potentially right there. And this is looking straight towards where that proposed tile would connect with the existing tile project. Um, the proposed tile, or each of the tile lines are being placed in areas that function as part of the same watershed. According to the certified wetlands determination, there are no wetlands in the proposed area for the drain tile. Um, on, staff, on May 28, 2014, staff conducted a site visit and determined that the proposed tile lines are being placed in traditionally wet areas where water flows naturally. The applicants plan to connect the line, tile lines with an existing bore under 256th Street, as, I, as I've mentioned, to the existing tile south of 256th Street. <clears throat> Staff finds that the proposed tile lines will be placed in traditionally wet areas and should allow water to continually flow into the intermittent stream, which connects with Split Rock Creek. So staff recommends the drainage board approve drainage permit 14-20. So if you have any questions, Feel free to entertain any questions that you may have. Do you have any questions this morning for David? We might in a bit. Let's okay. go ahead. With okay, I will go ahead then. Um, the proponent, does the proponent of this have any comments? The proponent, the per people in favor of this, are there any comments from the people in favor of this drainage system? Just identify yourself with your name and your address, please. Um, Thank you. Pete Johnson, 48320, 255th Street. I've lived within uh, a mile of this site for over 70 years. Uh, I owned that farm for 28 years before Dan Irvine bought it. The spring water and runoff water has been running down to the river since the railroad put the underpass for the tracks in the 1800s or before. It's, if, the, if the tile is put in or not put in, there will always be water running down that, underneath that underpass down to the river. If the tile is put in, there will be more clean filtered water coming through the tile and less runoff water because the ground won't be so saturated with water that it will take in more runoff water in a, in a big rain. The well is over 130 steps or over 100 yards from where the tile water will be running down the river. Dennis Hoven, who has worked on the well, says the well is about 80 feet deep. It has a well casing to down about 30 feet and the rest is in quartzite rock. He says the water comes from an underground aquifer, probably from Canada. I got three wells, and Lowell Wurchie has one that is in the same aquifer. All four was dug by Rudy Brothers from Flandreau. 
one of my wells is only 28 feet from a tile, and I have had no problems with it. The, wa the tile water and water runoff water is all on core site all the way to the river, if you can see by the pictures, I mean you can't see that here, and gets the water will never run uphill through solid core site and get in the well. The well is located 20 feet or more higher than the tile water. Dan Irvine said in his complaint letter that he is surrounded by quartzite. So it's all it's all quartzite all the way, all over in that down there. I, when I tried to couldn't put in post, couldn't do nothing. So it's all it's all solid quartzite. You're not going to have water. I don't feel that he has a problem whatsoever with that. And if if you did take a could see the picture here of the buildings. His well is way up here, right next to his house. Can you point? There's the water run. Mr. Johns, can you can you show Robert? He'll point on the map where it's at, so we can see. There, Ooh. David, can you point to it? That ain't very big picture there. Um, that's not the right one. Oop. There we are. On that. Uh, that corner spot down there. Uh, lower yeah. right, actually. Yeah, other way. There you go, Rob. Oh, Dan could tell you two words that it's up by that little no. Yep, you were at the right spot before, Robert. <laughs> now go up. No. That's good. But you can see where the rock. Robert. You got a pen, Robert? But you can see where it is. through there when I own the place I don't know what year the waters run through there all year round every day of the year and it, this putting the style on is not going to make any difference the only thing I feel if I had it I'd be happy that they did put tile in because I'd have a lot cleaner water coming through there when they put that tile in a week after John put the tile in a week after he put the tile in the water was coming through the tile but also running down through the gully and I've had tile for 35 years, and, and we drink out of it and take it home and put it in the refrigerator and everything else. And uh, I drank out of that, and it was great. But the muddy water was coming down through the dugout. Well, when these when we come back three weeks later, the only water that was running was coming out of the tile, and it was nice, clean water. Uh, to me, it's it's a real advantage as far as for Dan because he's going to have good pure water coming down there instead of runoff water. Runoff water will carry your chemicals, but when it's filtered down through the ground four or five feet and comes through a tile, it's it's uh, it's not it don't carry all them chemicals. So that's how my feeling about it. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Are there any questions for Mr. Question. Johnson? Oh, how many acres are you going to be tiling there? Is that is mine? That probably about twenty. Uh, 20 some acres. Okay. And Stan, I don't suppose Stan's going to have more than about. Have you ever had your well tested? Have I ever had my well tested? Yeah, for nitrates, whatever. Uh, I got, no, okay. my well is, is real good. And okay. all the wells are, because we're, in, we're under that, we're in that aquifer. Or like the Rudy brother says, it's the underground river, they called it. Okay. It is very hard, but we don't have no nitrates or anything in it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any other questions for Mr. Johnson? Any other proponents that would like to speak? Anyone else in favor of the drainage that would like to speak? And this would be the time for the opponent. If you are you a proponent? Yeah. Okay. Identify yourself and address, please. Stan Hansen, four eight three two fifty third Street, four eight three two four two fifty third Street, Garrison, South Dakota. I am. Could you the, speak uh, up a little, Mr. Hansen, please? Yep. Yeah. Pardon me. Speak a little louder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
I don't have a real strong voice, but you stick uh, your mouth in the microphone. All right, all right. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> my drainage project is right to the to the east of the map. Mm -hmm. uh, it would drain probably uh, 10, 15 acres, and um, I've had numerous uh, tiling projects, and um, from my experience. Uh, the soil profile can actually hold more water uh, in, in large rain events, and if I was Mr. Irvine, I'd be more concerned about surface runoff than I would uh, uh, drain tile water. I guess that's all my only comment, but thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hansen? Okay, seeing none. Um, any other proponent comments? And we'll go to the opponent comments if you'd like to speak in opposition to the tile. I'm Dan Irvine, 48343 256th Street <coughs> in Garrison. I, um, as far as the well location, the well location is about 300 foot from where the outlet is there. Um, as far as Pete said, the elevation and such on that, he's, he's correct. It's probably elevated up above where the tiling is. Um, the stream is an intermittent stream. It doesn't flow all the time. There's been times when I've been out there that uh, since I've been there, I've been there 21 years now. And there's times that the uh, stream, well, three years ago, was bone dry. Couldn't see anything in it. Nothing running through it. We had a dry year that year. Most of the years, more often than not, the stream is dry towards fall. That's where my main concerns comes in is what, with my well, situated as it is, it's going to draw water from wherever it can. And if the drain tiling is still draining, it's going to draw that water through there. <clears throat> I've got a report from the USGS that talks about they did a study on grounds, the, the reaction of water in the grounds, different types of ground, and they, they do say in there that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the surface water and ground water, it's all interconnected. There really isn't that great of a difference. One, sure, when it goes through the ground, it purifies, but part of my problem there, as Pete said, is uh, mostly quartzite. I've had, I've had some drilling samples done down south of where the well is across into the tillable ground and there's a lot of sand and gravel there. Now sand and gravel and quartzite <coughs> do not filter the water. The water flows through it with the chemicals that are in there. It's not obstructed. If you have soil, that will filter the water, but the sand and gravel, the quartzite will not. Sometimes the quartzite has pockets where that water will set in, and, and it will be contaminated water. As far as <clears throat> Mr. Barr's question about nitrates, I have had my well tested. My well tested out at seven parts per million. If you get to ten, you could possibly have problems. When I moved out there, we had young children. That's why I tested it. If it gets over five parts, they recommend that the young, the infants, not use the water. If it gets above ten parts, they recommend that adults not use the water. They'll call it, it's called the blue baby syndrome. The babies will suffocate, basically. The nitrogen, nitrates, replaces the oxygen in their blood system. That's the main concern that I have. I have a, a granddaughter that's a year old now. She doesn't live with us, but she visits us. Um, I expect more grandchildren. I, I do not want our well contaminated by this stuff. I also in the USGS, <clears throat> they readily admit that the chemicals are changing so fast that they cannot test them fast enough to tell you what's going to happen in relation to water, in relation to how it absorbs in the ground, in relation to the contamination of wells. 
I do believe I'm on an aquifer. That aquifer runs all the way from Canada, picked up the nitrate somewhere before it got to my place, or they picked it up at my place. Um, but like I said, I've just got all kinds of information here that they, that they tell you about. <clears throat> and if I honestly felt that uh, this would not create any problems, I wouldn't be concerned. But I do. I, I'm fearful for my water supply. Um, I don't know. I guess. I guess right there. I'll, I'll have to ask you if you have any questions. I guess there is one more part in this that I can uh, show on here. Just it's just a source information from USGS. Basically, you know, part of it. If you can do that very well. So part of it, the green, the green portions of those globes up there, are nitrate problems that they have found throughout the country. And the the nitrate problems by the manufacturer, by the source that they know where the sources are, has been mostly contained because of pollution programs and because of government regulations. The problems where they're having the biggest share of the problem is, is from the farmers, the runoff. If you have heavy rains, as Pete said, you get some runoff, but the runoff doesn't just stop. It doesn't, all of it doesn't continue to go on through to the stream. It deposits along the way. It drops off the nitrates along the way. And if my well draws that in, there's a problem. Some of these, <clears throat> some of these that you can see on here, they're well over. Um, and this is this is a little bit north of us. There isn't anything right exactly in our area. But that right there is probably, um, you know, over three quarters percent nitrate nitrate problem in their water that they tested up there. I'm sure, around the farming communities, you're going to have. Well, I shouldn't say that. I want to say around farming communities you have more, but there is a lot of problems that they have in cities too with nitrates um, because of fertilizing yards and, and different things like that. But like I said, um, my main problem is, is I'm, I'm fearful <clears throat> to lose my well, uh, that I can use it as a source of water for myself and my family. I called up Rural water, talk to them. They said with the railroad on my north and west side, and the quartzite comes out of the ground on my south and east side, that it would cost at least $7,500 to run rural water into my property. They have to get a special permit to bore under the railroad tracks. Uh, the railroad also requires some additional casings and things like that. And that $7,500 was if they don't hit any serious granite under there. Um, the sky's the limit. Uh, the other thing is, is it's going to, uh, it'll be a $40 minimum charge. That's what, I shouldn't say minimum. That's what the average family uses is $40 for water. I also have livestock that I use, that use my water at times. So, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Question. Okay. Commissioner Kelly. Um, <clears throat> you said you tested it. I, how long ago did you test it, the it's, well? It's, it's probably been um, 10 years ago now. Have you tested recently? I just tested the other day, and the results aren't back yet. Because, okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, if, if it's at seven, staying at seven, there isn't a problem. Um, Unless you have infants there. Okay. Well, there's standards, and, and 10 is the standard. Is that not correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Um, so I, I guess my concern, you know, my interest would be in, in whether there's been any change in the 10 years in the nitrate level and whether there were any tests prior to that. Um, I understand the concern with the cost of bringing in rural water, but 
if it becomes a major concern, the the nitrate problem at seven or ten is solved somewhat by the by the rural water. Uh, but I uh, I guess you know if there hasn't been a change, then it's within acceptable. It's within acceptable levels. It is at this time. I well, I know, but but there's nothing. To, if it hasn't changed in seven in ten years, then mm -hmm. I don't know why it's an issue. I don't understand your question. I guess until you get the results of your test you just had, um, okay. which we have no idea. But if if there's no change in the level of nitrate, then maybe seven is just what it sits at. That, that tiling or anything else isn't going to affect this. The tiling has just been put in, so I'm I'm doing kind of a a um, a test now to see what the levels are now, and then as I progress through the years, if this tiling's allowed, I'm going to have to maintain and keep testing it to see to see where my levels stay. I didn't have any reason before to really believe that the nitrates or that the chemicals would increase as long as things were pretty much status quo. But, okay. I, I, but you haven't offered any evidence that, that that the tiling will affect the nitrate level? Have you? Or if you did, I missed it. The tile is just put in. Okay. I mean, the tile, what, what happens is, is as, as the ground is drained, <clears throat> It drains off the nitrogen, which is a fertilizer. That nitrogen moves downstream, and maybe it drops off at different portions along the way. Maybe the lower portion, which has happened before, my creek up above, up towards Pete and, and Stan's property up there, the, that slough ground, that filtering area has been damp there, but the water has not been flowing through my property. Not been so. If the nitrogen comes down to that point, sets there, it gets closer to my well source. And then the nitrogen turns into the nitrates. And if, if I'm, I'm just afraid that if they pull it out of those fields up farther and drain tile it and dump it down within 300 foot of my well, that that's going to increase the nitrates in my water. It's going to increase the chemicals that they have up there. You can say that water looks nice and clear coming out of the pipe, but I, I, I don't think I would, I would uh, feed it to my granddaughter. Commissioner Barth? Um, you know, I, I do know that nitrates are an issue, but I also know that there are some uh, ways of, uh, uh, there's bioreactors which reduce the nitrate in a, uh, in a drain system. But in looking at this last uh, area where the water goes across your property, it looks like that's been uh, rushing across that area for, you know, a hundred years or more, and that the topsoil has been washed away, and that water is not going to lollygag there and, and soak in. And at the same time, you're grazing animals there, and and you know they have their own special pollutant that uh, sure. they contribute, and that's also <coughs> near your well. Um, mm -hmm. So. Wouldn't it be better to have that water zip by than to, you know, have it soaking in on, on the hill above you? If it does zip by, that would be ideal. Um, they had some pictures up there earlier to where they, you saw it pooling right down as soon as you got off onto my property. It was pooling there. You know, that that's kind of a... I think just north of your part, north of the... The railroad tracks where where it stops, right? Isn't that the pipe is right on the the, the, the west north. side or north side? Yeah. However you want to look at it. And then it goes another 15 feet or something to uh, the culvert under the tracks, right? It does. It well, the, the drainage does. The pipe does not. Right. Um, and how big is that culvert under the tracks or whatever? I would guess it's probably about four foot. So it's it's had a heavy load in the past. When you yeah. get a big rain, it comes. You could float your canoe there. Huh? <laughs> be, be a fast ride. <laughs> okay. Is there anything that your neighbors could do that would make this um, better for you? Well, I guess um, 
myself, my wife have talked about if they have if they want to open an account or something that that they could put money into the account where we could draw back if we needed to put water into our property if we were harmed by their drain tiling. Um, if uh, you know, there, did you say there's something that you could do to reduce reduce nitrates and drain yep, tiling? it's system? called a bioreactor. You run uh, the the tile water through a bunch of wood chips. Okay. Basically, you take a <coughs> area of me to Commissioner Kelly and have a bed of wood chips about four foot deep, and can't be pine trees, by the way. It has to be different trees. But uh, it takes out 80 percent, I think, of the uh, nitrates, at least in the studies that SDSU has done. Well, that make me feel a little more comfortable. What does it do for the <coughs> chemicals, the other the pesticides? They, and herbicides they're not finding uh, that much of that in there, I guess. On, uh, mm -hmm. my, my. Here comes uh, Scott here. <coughs> Excuse me, just for a second. But Scott Anderson, the planning department, and g looking at this property, you may not be able to install a bioreactor given the depth of the bedrock. Because you, as you said, you need to dig, you dig down four feet. You may hit bedrock there or the quartzite. And that actually, uh, you know, again with the water rushing across your your land, I I'm not sure that yours would be the spot to put it, but. Uh, just mention this technology is available. Okay. Let's get them done. Yeah, they're just just so you understand, the water doesn't always rush across. It dries up completely sometimes. So that's the times that I'm concerned about is when it's draining from up above, but it's not draining out. It's pooling. There's a there's a filtering slough uh, right up above this that it could be setting in for a while, and that's where. It, that's that's the times I'm afraid if this if this well draws, and it happens to draw from that point, that I'll be getting the nitrates and stuff down into it. I'm not worried about when it's big flow. One I'm more really question, not. ma'am. Yep, Commissioner. Uh, sir, when do you expect to get a, a result on your well test? Well, I sent it to the national laboratories to get it tested. I think they said it was seven to 14 days and I sent it probably about three, four days ago. Any other questions? I just, I have a comment. Um, I do have a well. My well is about 80 to 90 feet deep through granite. I am within 100 yards of lots of tiling. My property sits below the tiling. The tiling is higher and actually runs back into behind my house into another pasture. According to my well guy, I have no fears. I've also um, know of a situation where ground was flooded over top of the well cover completely. We would with it was not it was my brother-in-law's place and um, in a pasture full of manure and everything else. And he was positive his well was contaminated. His well is in solid granite, and um, I mean they drilled hundreds of, and they came out. They tested that well and they said there had been absolutely no contamination with the water over top sitting over top of that well cover for days before the water receded. They said there was absolutely no contamination through that and no contamination leaching down in it, even with feet of water sending over top of it. I've never had any concerns about my own well, and I'm closer than you are to, to several tile lines, and I sit low. And I've been assured that it isn't an issue, although I haven't retested my well since I initially put it in. So, is there any you other have, comments? <coughs> Do you have a, a modern well? Is it just been dug? Mine was put in probably 23 years ago. Yeah. Oh. Mine, mine had a windmill above it at one time, so I'm not real sure it's yeah. quite that tight, you know. Commissioner Kelly. I'd like to make a motion. There, are there any other opponents? I was going to say, are there any other opponents to this? Are there any other proponents? You can. Identify yourself. <clears throat> Name is John Zomer. Uh, I reside at 26326 47th Avenue, uh, Valley Springs. Uh, again, I own uh, this land up there that we're talking about right next to uh, Mr. Irvine. And I just would like to make um, a couple of comments. Uh, first being, I did initially talk to Dan about uh, doing tiling, and he shared with me his concerns about well contamination. Um, 
myself, having grown up on a on a farm where we we grew up on well water, um, and and I I uh, also would like to submit that there are experts out there who will argue the opposite of what information Dan provided us as far as what kind of water really is coming out of these tiles. Um, I have also done research uh, as a, I try to be a good neighbor, and I told Dan that if I had any inclination at all that I thought I would contaminate his well, I wouldn't even be here discussing this with you. I, that's the last thing I would want to do. Now I'm, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Irvine is tested, uh, took a test of his well water. Um, a year down the road, three years, five years, ten years, if his nitrate levels are shooting way up, we have a problem. And I think at that point in time, uh, because Dan is now establishing the, the quality of his water, he will have a very strong case against us upstream farmers who have since tile. Um, and aside from that, it, the water that Dan is going to get our water, regardless. It's either going to come through washing over top of the ground, or it's going to come through a filtered process through tile. In fact, Dan is going to get water from us both ways in a hard rain. It's going to come over top of the ground, water runs downhill, we can't help that, we can't stop that. Um, I'm not a betting person. If I was, I, if, if any of this farm uh, runoff water is content, uh, raising his nitrate levels, when five years approaches, ten years approaches, I'm going to guess his nitrate levels will go down. That's my personal assessment opinion based on information on studies that I have read with, with tile water. Any questions? Any other proponents? Thank you. Yeah, one more. Mr. Johnson. I'll state my name and address. Thank you again. Pete Johnson, 48328, 255th Street. Uh, the only couple of deals that, like you were saying about your, everybody's down through Corsite or they're down through solid uh, granite. Our wells are there, and another thing Dan talks about contaminating his well. His well is in an aquifer. There's probably 40 wells around there that's in the same aquifer. That little bit of water that's running through his place is not going to get through that 300 feet of course site. It's going to run down to the river. Um, if that if the runoff water would get in the in the course site it'll get in that underground aquifer. It will not just stay in that little place where his well is. His well will, I would guess that he could go to my place and his place and, and uh, low Worchies and have all the water checked and every one of them would come out the same as far as nitrate and uh, whatever else is in the water. I know his, I'm sure his water's hard because it was hard when I owned the place. And all the water in all our wells, low war cheese and everybody's, is very hard. It's good water, but it's very hard water. So I don't know what the concern is, how you're going to ever condemn somebody's well by, or ruin somebody's well by going through that much course site. It'll never come even close to it. So that's all my comment is. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Any other comments? Commissioner Kelly, did you have a motion? I would move to uphold the decision of the Planning Commission. I have a motion to uphold. Do I have a second? It's the decision of the staff, I believe, that the Planning Commission yep. didn't give it. Yep, Commission of the staff. To approve the administrator. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second to uphold the Planning Department's, uh, department's decision. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? We need some clarification okay. on that because there, this 
There is no decision of the planning staff. Okay. Today you need to make uh, an, you're approving the or drainage denying the okay. as the drainage board. I would change that to rec uphold the recommendation of the planning no. staff. No. no. To approve, to the, approve the drainage the permit yeah. to approve application. The, okay. Uh, that's my motion. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the drainage permit application for 14-20. Right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Item number 13 is authorize the chairman to sign a contract amendment between Minnehaha County and Armor Correctional Health Services Incorporated regarding staffing of medical director position. Jeff Gromer. Good morning, Commissioner. It's Jeff Gromer. I'm the warden for the jail here for the county. Um, I'm here to just address the proposal from Armor Corrections on adjusting the or Armor Correctional Medicine on adjusting the health services contract, uh, specifically relating to the uh, physician coverage and medical director's position. The original contract was written to indicate that the medical director would be position would be filled by a physician uh, working 32 hours within the for the county. It was budgeted at $125 an hour. Um, Armour has proposed an adjustment to that arrangement which would allow for the hiring of an advanced practice nurse or a physician's assistant. Um, the proposal indicates that the medical director's position would be filled by a medical doctor or a physician uh, working in conjunction with the residency program for 16 hours per week. Um, that would be filled by Dr. Gene Heisler with the Center for Family Medicine, um, and then a portion of those hours would be covered by uh, doctors in their residency program. Uh, the other 16 hours of the 32 would be covered by the advanced practice nurse or physician's assistant who would be hired by Armour. In addition to the um, 16 physician hours as well as the 16 hours provided by the uh, nurse practitioner or the physician's assistant, Dr. Heisler would perform the required supervision of the advanced practice nurse or physician's assistant. Uh, the dollar figure for this doesn't have a tremendous effect on the original budgeted amount. We had originally budgeted for about $125 an hour for the medical director's position, so just over $200,000. Uh, based on the proposal, the physician hours would be at $150 an hour. The advanced practice nurse would be in a range of the $50 or $60 per hour, which and then $1,500 a month for those supervision requirements. Uh, the total of that comes in in that $85,000 to $93,000 range. So it's a net decrease in what was budgeted with just a minor adjustment in the way that services are provided. Are there any questions for Warden Gromer? Look for a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the chairman to sign an amendment between Minneapolis County and Armour. Um, Correctional Health Services. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks. Thank you. Item 14, authorize the chairman to sign change order number two for an increase of $43,700 to the contract with Pram Construction Incorporated for additional structure removal and new backfill material on project MC 121 STR 13. Jason Reeves. Good morning, Jason. Commissioners. Uh, Jason Reeves, Project Engineer with the Highway Department. Uh, we have a change order for the uh, Highway 121 projects, which is also Eros Road uh, the, with Pram Construction. This will be the second change order for this project. Um, two items on the change order. Um, on, the, on the pictures that I submitted with the memo, uh, the contractor ran into what, what we found to be the old bridge deck in the bridge that was prior to the one that was in service. Um, you can hopefully see it a little better on your pictures, but uh, the rebar was is sticking up out of the ground on the one picture, and that was covered by the, the vegetation prior to when we started construction, so we weren't able to realize this was going to happen until they really started to dig into it um, figuratively and literally speaking. Um, and then also their old footings were there, and if where the arrow's at on the old footing, and then um, on the bottom picture under that, um, where you can see that old footing. Well, the new footing 
actually goes in the exact same spot as that footing so it was really not possible to do any of this work without removal of that um, as they went digging around on the this is on the north bridge which they're still under construction on the south bridge um, they went and did some digging around on that also to see if we would have the same scenario so that we could have a price for the entire thing rather than doing two separate ones uh, found the same scenario on that bridge that the old bridge deck and some footings are also in <coughs> the channel bed of that bridge which we are going to need to remove um, they're asking for $36,000 to do this work, which is a significant amount of money, I realize. Um, the removal, just in comparison, the removal of the two structures that were on the current roadway in the bid were $50,000. So I don't want to say we're getting a deal on these. They're $14,000 less than the ones that they're removing, and we didn't know that they were there, and they have to dig through all the mud and, what, and water and whatnot to remove these. So we do feel that this is a fair and just price. Um, they've also asked, asked for two weeks of extension for for this item to do the removal of the two structures that were in the channel, which we also feel is, is justified. Um, do you want do you have any questions before I go to the next item, I guess? I'm sure I do have yep. a question. So the debris there, the concrete pile from the old bridge deck, that's not the old bridge deck that we just removed, that's the one from before that? Correct. Uh, I believe the bridges that were in service that we're now replacing were put in in the 70s. That would have been the bridge deck from, say, the 20s or 30s probably. It looks like they they just they wrecked it down and dropped it in the channel and built the new bridges. Is that is that sort of a lazy thing to do? They Absolutely. They should not have done that. Yeah, and, okay. you know, they probably said, well, we're going to be long done dead maybe retired maybe dead and let somebody else deal with it and it's cheaper to do it this way I guess you know it, it's an unfortunate thing that you run into and unforeseen and, and this um, bid includes both bridges taking Correct. the debris out of the channel yep. okay any other questions for Madam Chair, I just have mm -hmm. a question here so do we have two items one with the bridge removal and one with the backfill is that and I was going to go to the backfill after this. Okay, is that one motion or is that going to be nope, two? Nope, we'll, we'll, yes, we'll, I guess my opinion would be that we do one motion because okay. the change order okay. is all one document with okay, both thanks. of these items. And so the backfill. Um, <clears throat> item number two is uh, backfill at the ends of these two bridges, which would be the approaches and then on each side. Um, in the bid was backfilling of existing material on the site. Um, I guess we're, we're exploring and looking into other options of this. Um, we obviously know that this is a continuing problem. Um, <clears throat> we've talked to the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Min, MnDOT has um, a different detail and opinion of what should be in the backfill. Um, talked to some contractors to see what they think. Um, we're, we've come up with this item for now, which is a it's a crushed quartzite material with a lot of what I call rock dust. Rock dust is extremely fine and extremely and it packs very hard. Um, I've worked with it prior. Um, I I think it's a very good material, um, way way better than what uh, native material would be. It just it just seems like it's that stuff settles a lot and then we deal with complaints over and over again and our department goes in patches over and over again um, so we'd like to we'd like to install this backfill on these bridges um, this is a pretty major road obviously and I'm not gonna say it's gonna completely eliminate the bump my opinion is is that it's going to help it I, I like I said we if it works if if we get a contractor if they if they compact it in there well which we do testing and whatnot for it um, if it performs well it's something that we as a department would like to become more standard in our bridges if it doesn't perform well I guess we go back to square one and try again but um, outside of putting uh, approach slabs coming up to the bridges which are typically in the eighty to hundred and twenty thousand dollars a bridge bid item um, this could continue to be somewhat of a problem but like I said we're, we're we want to try some new backfill material to try to make it 
a lesser problem and this is what we're proposing and uh, seventy seven hundred dollars was the price for both structures which would be four ends if you want to call it that um, for the material and and then one day of additional work because we we're asking them to excavate further back um, on the approach to get more material in there to hopefully help our our bump problem so that's my if you have any other questions Commissioner Brown. Madam Chair, I'll uh, make a motion to approve uh, both these items on a single motion second we do have a comment as well, which mm -hmm. the city of Sioux Falls seems to have a bump issue as well, and I've certainly gotten several comments from people about our bumps. So get those bumps out of here. The the DOT has the problem too. It, it's a it's an upper Midwest problem. I don't I don't know. It's it, freeze thaw in this area just wreaks havoc on that type of stuff. Thanks. Jason, with the um, change of date from um, September 18th to October 3, will there have to be a notification? Was there a notification put out to the public as to the completion date, expected completion date? And if there was, will we be? Yes, if, if we, these bridges, I guess, frame construction has three contracts with the Minnehaha County this summer. Um, in my opinion right now, I guess I still don't see these bridges taking Okay. up to the original completion date if we start to near that we will definitely um, let especially Eros and we'll probably give them more of a heads up than in, than anybody out there because they're obviously the most affected with the number of employees they have um, my opinion I guess right now is that it's still not going to get close to the September 28th date I still hope to see these open by September 1st but they do have they you know if it does go that far um, we still are not going to hold them obligated, but then I feel that they're going to be late on their other projects if this project goes out to that October 3rd date. So. Any other questions or comments? I have a motion to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Item number 15 is to authorize the chairman to sign the 2014 agreement between Minnehaha County and the City of Sioux Falls for detoxification services. Ken McFarland. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, as you know, in years past, we've had the good fortune to have the City of Sioux Falls participate financially with us in the operation of the Detox Center. One of the things that was holding up the 2014 contract was, in fact, you know, the, the big change that we were undergoing with uh, how we deliver detox services and the restructuring that we've done between the sobering center slash infirmary concept and the detox and then the, you know, some of the, the shift in numbers that we've seen. Well, I think we've got that all sorted out now. And so what we're bringing you is the 2014 contract for city participation in detox. And under the terms of this agreement, the city will pay $157,500 in 2014 in 12 equal monthly installments of $13,125. If you approve and sign off on the agreement, we will play catch up with that, you know, from the beginning of the year until now. Just for your, uh, just to realize the impact and what we we're facing, and we have a 10-month contract with Armor for detox services in the amount of $364,176. We anticipate a full year in 2015 is going to be approximately $410,000. And that compares to what we had in um, uh, originally for detox services in the 2014 budget in the Sheriff's Department of 751000 So as you can see, we had quite a shift there in dollars. So uh, this is one leg of the stool, and you'll hear about the other leg of the stool in a moment from Carol when we do the state contract. But uh, we do receive both city and state con funds for detox and uh, those dollars will be used to offset the cost of the program and then of course we supply the other third of those dollars so with that I would ask for your approval authorize the chair to sign that agreement with the city of Sioux Falls I have so. a motion and a second to sign the agreement any comments Commissioner Benega uh, Ken can you tell me what's happened with daily attendance since the contract philosophy has changed and that our numbers and Carol can uh, probably augment this but our numbers are far below 
what we were originally doing of, you know, we routinely under the old system ran 16 uh, per day and were full in that, uh, at that amount. Uh, some of our numbers today, I think even last week when I was checked, we were down to four and that within the center itself with some folks, of course, you know, we're, you know, we're heavily use, utilizing the sobering center concept. I can't answer today what's over there. Carol, can you tell me? Um, typically between three and five, yeah. So, so we've seen a dramatic difference. It has. It has. Yay. Yes. Yay. No kidding. <laughs> I have a motion and a second um, to authorize signing of the contract between the City of Sioux Falls and Minneapolis County for Detox Services. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Ken. Item 16, authorize chairman to sign the FY 2015 agreement between Minnehaha County and South Dakota Department of Social Services for clinically managed residential detoxification services. Carol Muller. Good morning, commissioners. Carol Muller, Minnehaha County Human Services. Uh, before you is the annual contract. We've received this for several years. It's an annual contract for reimbursement for the work that we do at Minnehaha County Residential Detox. And, um, would be open to any questions that you have. Last year, the contract was for $127,200. This year, the contract is for $131,418. And that new contract is effective June 1, 2014 to May 31st, 2015. Any questions for Carol? Commissioner Benega? I don't have a question. I have a comment because, as we well know, we were significantly harassed and beat up on a regular basis with the uh, old system. The new system has worked well, and not only that, is the state certification and the test scores have been awesome. Can you just tell us uh, a little bit about what uh, the recommendations and the, the results of that were just sure. briefly? Sure, Don't give so us a very report. short summary that's, yep. that's out there, yes. Um, well, as you know, Minnehaha County um, residential detox had issues with accreditation that were taking place. We are now back on track again with our regular three-year accreditation as of a couple months ago with an excellent score of about 97 percent. It was 97 point something percent, I believe. So we're back in place with that. The new concept, we've changed it underneath the new vendors so that we have a detox center for people who are transitioning and moving along and are uh, along that continuing of continuum of seeking treatment and the sobering center where people just need to sober up and are going to be in and out with that particular concept. It's a better use of resources that we have and making sure that we get people the right resources at the right time is really important for us to be able to do. But no, we, I will tell you it's, it's interesting that changed immediately up there. Typically between three and five, um, I haven't heard the numbers today. Yesterday when I was up there, they had four people, two were leaving, and I think they had three more coming in. Um, and I also have been up there at times where they've had zero. That it typically doesn't last for very long, but on occasion that actually has, has happened. So yes, we're back in play with everything working very well. Well, uh, if I can follow up with those comments, I just think that this whole process, besides being painstaking for quite a few months, uh, your leadership and the leadership of your team that's behind you uh, and the Sheriff's Department and everybody that's been involved in this process has done an excellent job of providing a system that works better and mm -hmm. frankly the results are in the pudding, so to speak, mm -hmm. and you and everybody else that has been involved, frankly, needs to hear more positive claims than what our experience has been. And I uh, want you to know that uh, the five of us or more up here appreciate those efforts well, because it's made a big difference in not just the budgets, but in people's lives, yeah. and that's what's really. And the it continues line. to be a learning curve and yep. some evolution with everything that goes along. Yeah. So, heck of a job. But great people. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. I would look for a motion. I make a motion to authorize the chair to sign the agreement between the county and the state. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes three to zero. Item 17, consider a motion to supplement $16,822 from the Emergency Food and Shelter Program Fund to the Emergency Food and Shelter Program budget representing the first half of the 2014 EFSP allocation. Carol Muller. Good morning. 
Uh, yes, Minnehaha County has been awarded, awarded $3,644 under the Emergency Food and Shelter Program. We refer to that as EFSP in our office. And these funds are provided by federal government and we're able to make use for them for gaps in our, gaps in our community. So we are in the process of uh, doing that right now. We're using them a lot for filling the gaps for motels and affordable housing issues that are existing within our community. So this, we typically get this in two drop downs. We were hoping to be able to do it all in once, but as soon as the second half drops, we'll come back and do the same authorization again. So this would be for the first half of that $33,644. Any questions for Carol? Entertain a motion. So move. Second. I have a motion and a second to. Very comment. Okay. Mr. Um, Kelly. I don't have a problem with this at all, but it's no wonder that we have a $17 trillion deficit in this country when this program was started as a temporary program in 1980, or rather 1980, and Lord knows how much money is in this program all across the United States. Uh, obviously, there's nothing temporary in government that we just continue to spend and spend and spend. Looking Madam Chair, yes. you know, I, it's a good point, Mr. Kelly, but there are those that believe that Medicaid funding would only last one year. I'll just point that out. <clears throat> yes, we do. We have a motion and a second to um, sign a supplement of $16,822 for emergency food and shelter mm -hmm. program. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. When. Uh, <coughs> Commissioner Barth calls me Mr. Kelly. I know that I'm going to get scolded. <laughs> <laughs> Item number 18 is a briefing on the coordinated assessment for reentry cart program operated by the Minnehaha County Human Services Department. Brett Johnson. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Just to give you a brief uh, history, I am the program coordinator for Alliance uh, through the Human Services Department. So in order to clarify the difference between Alliance and CART, just wanted to give you a brief history. I've been at Human Services for about a year and a half. And if you remember, I, I came before you about a year ago in requesting an additional uh, staff person for Alliance. Um, so to clarify the difference, um, when we went in and brought the Alliance program to the jail, we really wanted to create an a, uh, intense case management program to pro provide services to individuals that might have mental health, significant medical, and or substance abuse um, issues, along with unemployment and um, homeless issues. Um, in the process of developing this program and meeting with um, the lieutenants, um, Warden Romer, and the social services staff in the jail, the medical and mental health staff, we really saw that there was a greater need um, for discharge planning for individuals in the jail, um, not only for providing case management through Alliance, but really to create a stronger uh, program or a stronger reentry team. So um, out of those conversations and what we really saw as needs, we created what we call Coordinated Assessment Reentry Team, that's CART. And since November, we've actually been meeting just with human services staff, detox staff, medical and mental health staff from the jail. And in that time frame, we've really developed an understanding of the complex needs of the individuals that come and go out of jail. And they may or may not actually need uh, case management services from the Alliance program, but they might already be connected to some other services in the community. It's just in, when they're uh, booked into the jail, they may not share that information. And while they're in jail, uh, all that information may not be known. So. Um, what we're really doing is developing a stronger um, coordinated uh, process to make sure that these individuals, upon being released from the jail, are actually getting connected to the services that they might already be connected to. We might be able to coordinate with those entities a little bit better. And at the same time, um, in the future, hope that we will get people connected um, to the right resources upon entering the jail so we know that we can start making some plans right when they come in so we can stop and reduce the recidivism for those individuals. Um, just to share a little bit about the, the entities that we do have um, involved, we're actually going to start 
these uh, weekly meetings this Thursday morning. And along with uh, Minnehaha County Human Services, um, we'll have a, myself as a representative from Alliance, we'll have a, an emergency relief worker from our office at Human Services, we'll have detox, medical and mental health from the jail represented. We're also including Southeastern Behavioral Health Care from their case management program. We've got somebody from Evolve Counseling that's going to address um, the treatment needs of those, uh, the Native American population. Uh, we've got somebody that will eventually be coming from Falls Community Health. We've got the Glory House and Carroll Institute represented. So we're at least trying to address the medical, mental health, substance abuse, um, housing and unemployment needs of those individuals. So um, we're looking forward to moving forward this with this project. Any questions for Brett? Uh, Brett, Kelly? maybe two thirds of our inmates have mental issues of one sort or another. Um, you're, you follow up afterwards, and of course Alliance does the same thing. It, I guess you can't really separate these two, can you? But um, to get them to get them into some sort of help is that is that where we're going with this thing? Absolutely, what we're whether trying it's to meds do. meds or what it, whether it was counseling or whatever. Yes. What we're really trying to do is make sure that these individuals that are in the jail and if they do have mental health issues to address the specific population you're talking about is to really um, get the right entity and the right person in the jail to meet with that individual to get them connected to that appropriate service as soon as possible. What we've seen throughout the process of Alliance is that I will go in and meet with an individual and at some point assess that they actually need to be connected to Southeastern Behavioral or another mental health provider and then at that point transition them to that provider. With CART and with this coordinated assessment reentry team, we'll be able to address that much sooner and make sure that the right entity is in the jail meeting with that individual right up front and it's a much more warm handoff. What we found with individuals that do have significant mental health problems or medical or substance abuse is being able to limit the times they have to share their story and get reconnected to another provider. So if we can get them connected to that prior, provider much quicker in that process, the chances of them staying connected to that provider and getting those um, appropriate services will, will increase. So um, who I mean, they can't afford to go out to Southeast. Did, does Medicare cover this? Does the county cover it? Uh, did, the, did the VA get involved in this thing? Or we're at, Where we're at with this right now, Commissioner Kelly, is that we, we're, not, we're not seeking out any specific funding for any individual. When somebody, we look at each case individually. So when somebody is being discharged or released from, from the jail and we're getting them connected to the appropriate services, that service will certainly be the ones to determine what funding they have in place for the services that they do provide. So it doesn't necessarily follow that individual, much like Medicare or Medicaid, but each, each case would certainly be handled different in order to provide the, the right funding and the right services to that individual. Are you working with the VA a lot? Uh, I mean, As it stands right now, we don't have the VA involved with this team, but we certainly coordinate with them in cases that we're aware of somebody that's in jail that is that is a veteran. Okay. Any other questions for Brett? I just had a comment. Uh, there was a 60 Minutes program on Sunday, and I only caught the tail end of it, but it was on mental illness and um, them mental illness people revolving through the jail system, and they were, I think, specifically talking well, nationwide, but Cook County and Chicago, sure. and how high the population is there, and because of the closing of our mental institutions, if that's what you want to call it, those people have gone from one place where they were supposedly getting care and dumped into a jail system where they are not necessarily always getting care. And so, and thank you for what you're doing for their service. And I, I think people need to be aware of what has happened to this population of people that needs help. So, yeah, well, that's great news, and I, I certainly want to make sure that we. Um, we're very thankful for what Sheriff Milstead and what Warden Gromer have allowed us to do in terms of working collaborative, 
collaboratively with them mm -hmm. and giving us access to the jail so we can work on getting those individuals connected to the services in the community in hopes that we will stop that revolving door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Carol, the one thing that's really important to this is the communication. Carol, sometimes talk, people say please. Is Thank the you. communication, because sometimes people will say, well, why didn't they talk here? Why didn't they talk there? We've got them at the table, and that's pretty rare to have happen. Mm -hmm. But we've got everybody at the table. We had to do agreements, agreements, agreements between everything because of confidentiality and HIP and those type of things. We had to work through them. Mm -hmm. But again, why can't we all communicate? That's what's happening with CART. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Item number 19 is Minnehaha County Commissioner Liaison Reports. Are there any liaison reports? I'll just give you a brief one. I was in Philadelphia this last week with the Annie Casey Foundation along with Ken and uh, Jamie Gravitt from the JDC. And there were also there was about 17 people from the state of South Dakota that was there for the national convention. Um, we were looking at addressing, learning about um, child juvenile detention issues and how to solve um, the high numbers of population that have been locked up and try to put the right kid in the right place at the right time. It was a wonderful conference as always. Andy Casey basically foots the bill for this. Minnehaha County was responsible only for two airline tickets which were paid for out of their respective budgets. So it wasn't a hit on the county as financially, but they gave back to this community um, in many, many ways with a lot of educational opportunities, which um, are too numerous to um, tell you about at this point. And I hope to go back through my notes and just kind of um, go back through everything that I learned in those few days of convention. I think it was well worth the time away. So, Any other? Um, Liaison reports. Okay. That is there any new business okay. under old business? Um, I think we have a couple. I was going to ask um, um, Auditor Litz on behalf of the commission if you would uh, give us an update on what's happening with the millage voting issue that we had about a week ago. Came up here, uh, Bob Litz with the auditor's office, and I came up here in anticipation of this, but. First things first. Cookies? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to give it to me. I'm the one suffering from a well, cold. I, I was hoping Jeff would share that. But, uh, <laughs> I thought he was like Boehner. I thought he'd start crying. <laughs> Bob Litz with the auditor's office. End up. Uh, you know, I, uh, I went back uh, yesterday and reviewed uh, the commission meeting last Tuesday. And... Uh, uh, the uh, chain of events that led up to that was a uh, Monday uh, before the election about 10 o'clock I think it was I was summoned to the window downstairs and it was Mr. Millage uh, with his concerns about the uh, precinct uh, issue and uh, I, uh, I uh, explained to him that we were very busy and uh, he, I were left with the impression that he was okay with me working on it because I explained to him that I want to talk to the Secretary of State and Kirsten Kapmeyer and review the process. Uh, he, uh, he seemed okay with that but apparently uh, decided to change his mind on that later. Uh, what uh, what uh, I, I did uh, subsequently was I, I went and, and this was news to me at this point, at Monday morning uh, when, uh, when he brought it up. Uh, what, what I've done subsequently is I've tried to uh, trace the chain of events that put that on the map and uh, right now it seems a little bit hazy. Mr. Katmeyer and myself have had some uh, pretty good talks and uh, what, it, what it cooks down to is the state law uh, that uh, was put out when, uh, when the state uh, did their uh, their and or the uh, census uh, redistricting uh, and uh, there's a date when they accepted the redistricting as opposed to when the uh, place was annexed into the city and if you falls on that timeline if I'm you can correct me if I'm not getting this right fill in that timeline the legislative district would have precedence over anything that we did on the precincts now uh, I'm not quite done with my investigation of this here, and I'm also investigating the process of how this gets down there and, and why I was not uh, uh, privy to this going on the map before it happened. Uh, it's an unfortunate circumstance. I, I regret it. Uh, the timing couldn't have been worse for Mr. Mileage to move uh, into that development. Uh, I know that uh, right now there's six houses in there, and uh, they have plans for selling a lot more, so it's going to be something to deal with. But, uh, you know, as I look at it, Mr. M uh, Mileage certainly has a concern that I view as valid. Just looking at it, common sense would tell you that, but I was not ready to concede that at that time without investigating it. 
uh, looking forward to, I also have to figure out which precinct that that uh, property is going to go into. He wants it to go into uh, Memorial, I believe is what he said, but I'm not certain I can do that either. So uh, the answer that I want to give you today is I'm not quite done to, to tell you exactly what we're going to do. Did he vote? Yes, he did vote. Okay. Commissioner Barr? Um, Auditor Bob, um, you know, what happened there is that little bit of land out in District 11 was moved by you into District 9 in violation of the state statute, which was uh, took effect on April f uh, 1st of 2010. And, you know, if, if that was alone the issue, that would be certainly a problem. But in my view, this whole uh, election has uh, many issues uh, which might lead our result to be tainted. Certainly, I believe that your count was correct. But if you have the example of um, a husband and wife being forced to vote in different precincts, well, some of those races for precinct committeemen are extremely close. Uh, June Staggers lost to Elizabeth Larkin 37 to 35. A single person coming across would make a big difference in that race. So, you know, as we have uh, in, the, in the city election, we had the absentee issue with Rebecca Dunn. We had voter confusion over vote anywhere. We had a wrong ballot given to someone in the, in the T area school vote. Uh, we had elderly folks didn't know where to go. We had uh, ch so many changes. There was no voting location in the Walmart area. People without cars were going to have greater problem. But then we look at our primary election here, and we have, again, that husband and wife issue. We have people that uh, were not offered immediately the uh, Democratic ballot, were just handed the nonpartisan ballot. The changes in precinct locations. The discouraged voting. Uh, I just talked to a woman yesterday who went to vote, and she wasn't on the list. Uh, so she didn't have time. She didn't vote. Her mother went to vote. She wasn't on the list. She didn't vote. Our legislative boundary change, like I said, hundreds of calls to your, to your office. I talked to one uh, supervisor. I had emails with one uh, voting supervisor. And she said that uh, she had half a dozen cases where one spouse was told to vote in one location and the other in another. And it's possible that you know the, the line between precincts goes between the front bedroom and the back bedroom, <laughs> uh, but I doubt it. Um, you know, the number of calls, they had 191 votes at that precinct, and she said she had to call about 25 of them. You know, this was a low turnout election. This was, uh, you know, very few people voted. What the heck is going to happen when we go to November and all of this stuff hits the fan? You've already violated the law. You've already confused half the people. What's going to happen, Bob? I violated the law by this, this district thing. It was done by staff and unbeknownst to me at the time, sir. Okay, who's in that... charge? Well, I'm in charge. Oh, wait. It's your staff that's doing this. Well, you know, it, it, it showed up there, and I, I said Monday morning was the first time I saw it. If I'm guilty of that, then be so. This is your fourth year of being in this job. Shouldn't you be pretty darn good at it now? Well, I would, I would submit to you, Commissioner, that every day I learn something new, as do you. Me too. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, the allegations that I'm uh, you know, involved with criminal activity, that, that, that's criminal. upsetting to me. That, well, that should be upsetting to you. You, of course, accused well, Rebecca these are allegations of criminal activity. made by you. Okay. I, I just know that the law was broken when we changed those people to vote in a different legislative district. Those borders are set by the legislature, not by our auditor's office. Are there any other questions on the subject or comments? Any other old business? I'd like to bring up one thing. Uh, Ms. Staley was down here, uh, you know, advocating the uh, uh, sell sending out of uh, uh, voter uh, cards informing people. And if you want to do that, uh, we have 118,000 uh, registered voters. About 109,000 of them are active and 9,000 aren't. It would cost you uh, about uh, $38,350 per election. Commissioner Kelly? Just a thought, Bob. Have you ever thought about setting up a 
a hotline from the precinct workers to someone sitting down in your office or maybe two people that if there's a question that can be answered immediately by one person and yes mr kelly we have full staff on that day and everybody is answering questions and we do have a separate elections line that was lit up pretty good uh you know the 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 problem here besides the the confusion about some people get to vote everywhere people thinking they get to vote everywhere honestly was the data that we got into poll book. Uh, smaller counties, uh, and I would also tell you that this was a prevalent across the state this time. Well, we're not just the only ones, we're the biggest ones and the ones that uh, get focused on here. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I have ordered since then is we are doing a complete audit of all 118,000 plus registered voters in Minnehaha County. We're gonna go through each one of them. Uh, you know, it, it irks me too, it's very embarrassing to me too that uh, when I get things back from a database that they are skewed, there's things uh, that are missing on it, and uh, you know I get accused of intentionally uh, doing those things, and it's simply not the truth. Uh, I, I bet if anybody else was in my shoes right now, they'd be sitting there with the same problem. Uh, just, I just don't know what the fix is except to do what I'm doing, and that's clean off our side of the street. I've got a hard copy of things the way they were right after the election, and I'm gonna do a hard copy of things right after we're done doing that. And I'm also gonna find somebody that's gonna come into our system and, and from the state's end down and look for viruses or some kind of a computer malfunction. Outside of that, folks, I'm afraid I don't know what to do. There's some things in this world that are out of my control. And try as I might, I'm merely an auditor in Minnehaha County, Jeff. That's it. This last week there was a story on Kelloland and I was actually called to, to do an interview on that and I was out of town at the time and two of the other commissioners were um, interviewed for that story um, and I guess I, I thought, you know, Kello should have called the auditor and asked him instead of asking the commission all these questions. General elections are extremely complex and um, to expect that we can just go to polling centers right off the bat, that was um, obviously a concern and it's getting dumped on us. I think at this point, you know, I'm, I guess I'm speaking commissioners without asking their permission, but I think that we lack the confidence in the auditor's office right now to pull off an election with a general polling sites and until we see some type of a written proposal on how this would run because when you have Minnehaha County, Lincoln County, the city, a ton of different races, different precincts, different legislative races, that would mean that there would have to be every one of those ballots in every place so that somebody in Baltic can go over and vote down on South Sioux Falls or or somebody in Lincoln County can't go to Brandon and vote. And so there isn't more confusion. And so I feel like it's getting dumped back on the commission that we're saying, no, we're not gonna go to polling places when we're trying to save the integrity of the elections without them falling apart. I would love to see polling centers at some point. I have to vote in Baltic. That's probably, I live closer to three other precincts than I do Baltic, but I go to Baltic and I work in Sioux Falls. So it is, I know it's a hardship for a lot of people and vo voting centers would be wonderful, but at this point, I don't think the, com the commission has the confidence that we should be changing the boundaries for polling centers for general elections because we're afraid of a disaster. Well, Commissioner, I think that for you to lay the blame all at the feet of the auditor's office downstairs is, uh, is not entirely correct. I would accept some of that responsibility, but there's a lot of moving parts in here and there's a lot of other people that I have to depend on to do an election. And like I said, I, I'm not in charge of the Secretary of State's office. Uh, I can't help if there's a human factor out there with a, uh, a an election worker that, uh, that makes a mistake due to the end of a long day. Uh, when, when we send out the voter cards to tell people where they go, that data has to line up with the post office's Melissa data system or else that card doesn't go out. I, I, can't, I can't control the post office and how they operate. Uh, somehow that total vote has to get in queue with the post office as well for all this mail to work. There's a number of uh, factors and you know, the 2012 election went pretty good and it was right after that when we migrated our data up. Our data was the same then that we migrated up and somehow uh, it's come back and it's, uh, I'm to blame for that data coming back uh, m messed up. I mean, I, I, I guess I accept that responsibility, but at this point here, I think I'm kind of helpless to do anything about it other than what I'm doing. And I think that's what the concern is, is that the commission doesn't want to move to something else until we're ready to move to that because there are way too many moving parts and we don't want to see more problems than the few problems that we've had. 
That, it, and I feel like it's coming back on the commission and we're getting blamed because why won't you guys go to the polling centers? Because we're not ready. That's the whole point. Anybody else? Commissioner Benega? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, everybody can go back in hindsight and say what should have been done differently. And I think the process now needs to be about <coughs> evaluating that, but more importantly, getting the interested parties together as a group, uh, including the city and the school districts and certainly the state, who has responsibility ultimately for the whole works to get everybody together in some conversations about uh, looking for ways to improve the system because if the system's got some uh, syntax errors, uh, we, we definitely need to uh, evaluate the whole process itself and frankly I'm not interested in pointing fingers. I want to know where the issues are and what frankly the solutions are. And the only way we're going to get solutions is to get all the interested parties together so that the next outcome is a better outcome because, uh, frankly, that's the most important part of the process, not uh, whether it's a political issue or a, uh, you know, I've never seen anybody solve a problem by uh, pointing fingers at each other. It just never works that way. And if that's our modus operandi, then frankly, we need to be looking at something different. But the other issue is, um, I think part of the problem is, is that um, I don't think people understand how complicated the process is with multiple school districts uh, in the city, multiple counties in the city, uh, state, the Secretary of State's reports being changed by our staff one day and then the next morning you check on that and it's back to the old system. There's just way too many issues that need to be addressed or bullet points that we've got to, to, to solve and I think that that ought to be the results that we're looking for. I agree with you, Commissioner. Commissioner Grath. Well, I think, Gerald, uh, you bring up some good points there and I think that the solutions are probably out there. Uh, I know that this isn't the first time uh, an area has been annexed into the city and, you know, that problem's been solved in, in other other years. Uh, the same thing in Rapid City, you know, Aberdeen, Yankton, whatever. And so those folks have been able to, I believe, uh, solve those that issue and I think we can solve it going forward, but it didn't look very good this particular election. We've probably done uh, five or six annexations, and they're fairly innocuous because they clearly fall within the borders. And like I say, Monday was the first time I became aware of this, and if I could have fixed it then, I would have done it. But I thought it, it, it bore a full investigation of what was going on. I can't, just because Mr. Mileage wants something, I, I might agree with him on the surface of it, but I feel an obligation to the election system to go fully investigate it and find out if indeed that is the case. I know state law trumps our precincts. I know those legislative districts do. I was here in the beginning when we did those, when that law came down from the legislature and helped implement that into the county precincts. Any other old business? Seeing none, we will adjourn into executive section for contract negotiations and personnel. That's my motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to um, Adjourn into executive session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously.